Hello, <laughs> and welcome to, uh, to this wonderful event from, from uh, the climate outreach side. We're really delighted that um, St. Mary's have uh, worked with us on this uh, as a partner, and we're really, really thrilled to see so many people here. Um, climate outreach at its heart is about talking uh, talking about climate change, an issue that if we don't manage to address it will have terrible consequences for us all. Um, often, however, it's easier to talk to people who are in the same camp as we are. Um, in the name of the future of the planet and the future of humanity, we really need to be talking to people who we would rather not, if we were honest, <laughs> actually talk to. So tonight is about com co climate conversations and how to have them. Climate outreach um, addresses also the science of climate communication. It, it is a social science, um, how to work on all this. Uh, we're a global organization based in the Cowley Road in Oxford, and the ten, of, the 10 people who now work there for the last decade, more than a decade or so, have been actually working on this problem of how to help organizations of all kinds, trade unions, NGOs, governments, political parties, um, and all kinds of organizations, faith groups even, <laughs> reach out and talk effectively to their constituencies about climate change. Um, the challenge of what our founder, who you'll hear in a minute, George Marshall, um, called uh, a socially constructed silence of climate change. Um, that's what we're going to learn about tonight. We're going to learn about the shape of this silence, the weight of this silence, and the difficulty of tackling this silence. And that will ho happen, we hope, through a conversation between George and Catherine, who we're absolutely thrilled to have here. So I hope that you will enjoy this, and I hope that a bit later on we'll get a bit of practice at talking, talking climate. Thank you very much. Hello. Am I picking up? Um, so, a few words of introduction to Catherine before she, before she, she comes up. Um, Professor Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist. Um, she's the director of the Climate Science Center at um, Texas Tech University, and her research currently focuses on establishing a scientific basis for assessing the regional and local scale impacts of climate change on human systems and the natural environment. So... A major, a major scientist, and it's always a thrill to hear from climate scientists. So thank you for your work, Catherine. And Catherine is just as passionate about her faith as you will hear. She's an evangelical Christian. She's married to Andrew Farley, a pastor of an evangelical church. Um, we're so pleased that her son Gavin is here, and she's traveling around the country and is just going to be heading up to Edinburgh as well and has just been in London and talking around. So what's made Catherine a hero of me personally, and for all of us at Climate Outreach, has been the way that she's brought these two streams in her life together, and that's what makes this fascinating, what makes her so unusual and individual as a person. And I think her determination, as we will be hearing this evening, to spread her science and her conviction to new audiences, which is very much close to our hearts in climate outreach. These huge areas of people who are not actively engaged. But what makes Catherine especially interesting, as you can tell from the, the title of his talk, um, uh, is that she has been going and speaking with some of the most notoriously sceptical audiences in the world of um, southern US evangelical conservatives, evan uh, um, amongst others. And that's one of the things we're going to be exploring this evening. So at a time when we desperately need to break the silence and find new ways of thinking, new narratives, and we need new communicators, especially trusted communicators who can build bridges across our divided and often fractured, polarized societies in the spirit of togetherness and love. I think Catherine is really a leader of our times and uh, a wonderful person, so I think we're going to really enjoy hearing from her. So Catherine, oh, let me just also explain the shape of this evening as well. We're going to hear a few words from Catherine for as long as she, <laughs> she feels inspired to speak. Um, then we're going to go... <laughs> she's laughing at <laughs> Then we're going to go into a conversation. We're going to explore these ideas and themes in conversation between us. 
then you are going to have a, a, a conversation, a chat with each other. You see, there's a theme to this, as Tani was saying. We want to get that conversation going, and then we'll open the whole thing up, and then we can open that up, and then you can be asking questions of Catherine as well. So it's going to start with you, Catherine. So please, do come up and uh, share your ideas and your thoughts. All right. Thank you, George. There we go. Why I was laughing when he said as long as, as you feel like speaking is because I grew up in a denomination called Plymouth Brethren. It began here in Plymouth. And one of the hallmarks of, of our church was that people spoke as the Spirit moved them. And I still remember one time a traveling brother arrived at our um, church unannounced. The Spirit had moved him to come that Sunday to travel from far away. And so he was given the pulpit, and the Spirit moved him to speak, and so he spoke at length, in great detail, started to go a little over time. I could see my mother surreptitiously checking her watch because she had the roast in the oven. But about 10 or 15 minutes over time, you could see he was winding to a close. He got to the end, he took a deep breath, and he said, and now for my second point. <laughs> At which point I could see my mother completely abandoning all hope of the roast. And that day's dinner was Swiss Chalet, a famous Canadian restaurant that serves chicken. I live in the heart of Texas. I live in a community where many of our neighbors are friends, people we've known for years, my colleagues at the university, do not agree that climate is changing and that humans could in any way, shape, or form possibly be responsible. But people who feel this way are only a tiny fraction of the population. They're concentrated disproportionately in certain states like Texas and in Washington, D.C. But aside from those locations, the vast majority of people would say not only that climate is changing, but yes, looks like humans are responsible. So often, as climate scientists, we are the, the garters of the trust, so to speak. We have the volumes of reports and the scientific papers that detail how the world is changing, what a tremendous impact we are having on our world. So often we feel that if we could just explain the facts to them more clearly, surely people would get it. We've progressed now to where we actually create color graphics. They aren't black and white anymore. We're even working on some animations. And I just heard that we're going to get some time on the NASA hyperwall. Surely that will convince people, right? We focus so much on the small but very loud proportion of the population who say, oh, it can't be humans. And it distracts us from what I am increasingly becoming convinced is the real problem. And again, remember, this is from somebody who lives in a location where many of the people around me do not think that this is real. The real problem is not that we don't agree with the science that tells us that climate is changing and humans are responsible, because the science that we use in our climate models is the same radiative transfer physics and nonlinear fluid dynamics that we use to design our airplanes and to run our stoves. You don't notice that many people saying that stoves aren't real or airplanes can't fly. Why do people reject the science? Even more importantly, why do people accept the science but aren't willing to do anything about it? It's because when you ask people, is climate changing, even in the United States, even in Texas, over 70% of people would say yes. Do you ask, do you ask them, you know, is, are humans responsible? Large parts of the US, <laughs> most of Canada, and most of the UK would say yes. But then you say, do you think you will be personally affected? Almost everybody says no. When you see a movie about global warming or you pick up a book about climate change, 
there is one image on the front of most of those books and on the poster of most of those movies. That is an image of something that is large. It's white. It's furry. (laughs) And it's usually sitting on an iceberg looking sad. It's a polar bear. Now, earlier today, I was talking with colleagues at the university. Most of us were climate scientists, or we studied something related to climate. And I asked everybody in the room, have you ever seen a polar bear in the wild? Not a single person raised their hand. So I'm going to ask you, there's more people here. Who has seen a polar bear in the wild? I'm not seeing... Do I have any hands? Okay, yes, thank you. One hand, all right. (laughs) So look at how many people there are here. The number one symbol of this global issue that has overwhelming implications for every part of society, the number one symbol is something that only two people in this entire building have ever seen in real life, me and him. I'm Canadian, so that doesn't count. Polar bears run through the streets of our cities, chasing seals. Everybody knows that. Just kidding. (laughs) We don't think it matters to us is the first problem. And the second problem is, we don't know what to do about it. If there is this overwhelming global problem that every human on earth almost is contributing to, and our personal contribution is just a tiny fraction of the overall problem that's been going on since the 1700s, And I know that whatever I do, even if I cut my carbon footprint in half, even if I reduce it by 80%, that will actually not have a tangible impact on the future of the world. And when everything I read in the newspapers just seems more depressing than the day before, we feel like there is nothing we can do about it. And so what is our human defense mechanism if we're confronted with something that we feel like we can't fix? I don't know about you, but my, de- my defense mechanism is to say, oh, well, I'm going to shelve that. I can't deal with it. Because if I focus on this huge problem that I feel like I can't do anything about, what's going to happen? I'm going to become anxious. I'm going to become stressed. I've even seen people have panic attacks when the words climate change are mentioned. So in many ways, this is what they call a wicked big problem that runs into our fundamental human psychology. It triggers fear, it triggers anxiety, it triggers feelings of powerlessness, as well as detachment, because again, the number one symbol of, of this problem is something that we have never seen, something far away in space, or possibly something far away in time. We view it as an issue that maybe our children or grandchildren will have to cope with, but not us. As a climate scientist, we're trained to talk about facts and data and information. We're not trained and we're actually often actively discouraged from talking about feelings and emotions, hope, fear. But this is exactly, I think, the conversations that we need to be having because when you ask people Do you think this is going to affect you? Almost everybody says, eh, probably not really. But there's one question that even more people say no to than that. You know what that question is? That question is, do you talk about climate change? Or do you even hear somebody else that you know talking about climate change more than once or twice a year? Hardly anybody does. Why? Because we don't know what to say. It's not for lack of data or facts or information. If you piled up all the assessment reports that have summarized thousands of peer-reviewed journal articles over the last decades, and yes, even centuries, the science goes back to the 1800s, if you piled up those assessment reports, the international assessment reports, the Royal Academy assessment reports, the federal reports, they would, I venture to say, reach at least the clear story and possibly the roof of this church. We do not lack for data or facts or information, but none of that is positive or hopeful. People often ask two questions. What keeps you up at night and what gives you hope? And the answer to what keeps me up at night is what the science is telling us. That's what keeps me up at night. 
Lack of information is not stopping our conversations. If you want to have a conversation on climate change every day, all you have to do is get one of the latest assessment reports. We just published one two weeks ago on behalf of the federal government in the United States. The incredible irony of the most up-to-date climate science assessment in the world being published by the government that is the only government in the world to be pulling out of the Paris Agreement is stunning. If you just took that single report and you took each one of the key messages and you talked about one key message every week, that would give you enough conversation for over a year. Lack of information is not why we're not having conversations. We're not having conversations because who wants to talk about depressing, sad, fear-inducing things when we feel like there's nothing we can do about it? When we feel like there's no hope? So, when I moved to Texas 10 years ago, so first of all, let me back up a second. Uh, moving from Canada to the US for graduate school, I went to graduate school in the US. Uh, moving from Canada to the US, I didn't realize at that time, and this was a while ago, so, so you know, don't judge me too harshly, I didn't realize there were people who didn't think climate change was real. You know, to me, growing up in the Canadian school system and living in South America part of the time, I mean, to me, you know, the sky is blue, the grass is green, climate is changing due to human activities. I moved to the States, and I was so unaware that there were so many people that thought this that my husband and I had been married for six months before we figured out we were on the opposite side of the fence on this. We can get into more, when we talk about our conversations, we can get into more of the conversations we had on this topic that introduced me to the idea that incredibly intelligent, smart, rational people can think that climate change isn't real, it has nothing to do with the facts or the data, it has nothing to do with the assessment reports that you can pile up to the ceiling, it has everything to do with culture with who we believe, who we agree with, who we think shares our values. By the time we moved to Texas together, I had figured out that there was a lot of people who didn't think climate change was real, and I had also figured out that a lot of them lived in Texas. <laughs> so moving to Texas was scary for me. I did not know what to expect. Why did we move to Texas, you might ask? It's because we both got positions at the same university. And in addition to being a professor of linguistics, my husband is also a pastor. And so a church, not only had the university offered him a position, a church had offered him a position as a part-time pastor and offered me a position too. What is the chances of getting three positions in the same place like that? Pretty much zero. When that happens, you have to go. I felt like there was a giant, you know, a giant fleece pinned to the door saying, go to Texas, written in big green letters. So mentally kicking and screaming, we moved to Texas. And within a couple of weeks of being there, I had gotten my first invitation to talk to a local women's group about climate change. I didn't know what to expect, but I, I did my best. I organized my PowerPoint. I got all the facts in there. Global temperature, sea level rise, future scenarios. And I went and I started with the science and I talked all about the science and I ended with the science. None of the questions I got were about the science. All of the questions I got were, okay, so what? That's interesting, and you're obviously passionate about it, but so what? So I had to stop and think, well, I believe I'm doing this because it's important, but why do I believe it's so important? It's not about what's up here, it's about what's in here that tells us why it's so important. And for me, the reason why I switched from astrophysics to climate science was for a very specific reason. It was because I felt that I could actually make a difference for people. Climate change is impacting people's lives, and the more poor and the more vulnerable we are, the more disproportionately affected we are by a changing climate, and that is not fair. So I felt that with my time here on this earth, what I could do best is to do everything I could to help fix this problem because in my naivete, when I, when I you know, switched over from, uh, from astrophysics to climate science in graduate school, in my naivete, I thought, surely we'll fix this thing soon. It's so serious. I'll help out for a while and then I can go back. I was doing it because I have a profound love and care for people that is tied directly to my faith. We're told in the Bible to love others as Christ loved us. We have already been loved, and we are to pass that love on to others. That was why I was doing what I did. But I'd never told anybody that. 
I had never said that to a single person. And so here I was expecting people in the heart of Texas to just magically care about this issue when I hadn't even shared with them why I cared about it. In fact, most of them thought I was an atheist because, of course, that's what scientists are. So after I gave the talk to that woman's group, one of the women who was there then invited me to speak to a different group. So when I went to that group, I talked more about what it means for Texas and, you know, local impacts. And then I got more questions on, okay, but, you know, so what? So what? So I realized then I had to do the most uncomfortable thing for a scientist. I had to speak from the heart. I had to tell them why I cared. And you might say, why does that sound so terrible? Because that's not what we do. We talk about data and facts. We are objective and unbiased. We do not open the secret recesses of our heart and reveal the beliefs and the values and the the person that resides there. That is not what we do. In fact, we are, in some cases, not just implicitly, but explicitly trained not to do that. So the first time I remember that I spoke to a group, which was a couple of groups down the road, there was the Kiwanis Club, there was the Senior Citizens Home, there was the Women's Book Club, there was the University Women's Club, then there was Second Baptist Church, not First Baptist, Second Baptist. They can be afforded to be a little more liberal in their views. I still remember the first time I decided that I should probably tell people, especially because most people in Texas would call themselves Christians, I should probably tell people that I was a Christian and explain to them why, as a Christian, I cared about it. It was as uncomfortable as pulling down your pants in public. And I really do mean pants. (laughs) Not just trousers. That's uncomfortable. You're revealing part of yourself that is not intended to be revealed to a large number of people, and certainly not while you're standing on a platform in front of them. That's the way I felt. But when I did it, something amazing happened. People's faces changed. You could see that their attitude changed. The questions I got were different. The questions I got were, okay, we're on the same side. And I'm just struggling to understand what you're saying, but I understand we're on the same side, so help me understand. The conversation was completely changed because we had connected, we had bonded over something that mattered intimately to us. Now, that bond, that connection, does not have to be the Christian faith. Every major world religion has at its core the idea of stewardship, or responsibility for the planet and care for the poor and the vulnerable, as little as so many of us seem to demonstrate it. It is there. But for others, it doesn't have to be that. It can be, and I've seen this happen, it can be something as, you may say, this may sound superficial, it can be something as simple as the fact that, you know, my friend Bill, who's a climate scientist, he grew up hunting. His family hunted. That was what his family did. They hunted together. So he connects with hunters. They understand, they speak the same language, they have the same values. He talks to hunters about climate change. Birders. Birders are very passionate about birds, and one of the biggest impacts we see on the natural environment is the fact that birds are moving in their ranges and being affected by climate change. Skiers. Parents. If you're a parent, you know, When you first lay eyes on that wrinkled red bundle screaming its head off, you would do anything for it. I still remember, it's a number of years ago now, but I remember when I first had my child, I remember actually fantasizing about all the ways I would kill anybody who tried to harm him. That's a profoundly disturbing image, (laughs) but it just shows you how strong the biology is. It was definitely biology that was doing it. We can bond and connect over our shared concern and love for and commitment to our children. A couple of years ago, I was invited to speak to our local Rotary Club. Now, I'm not a Rotarian, so I was unfamiliar with their four-way test. Any Rotarians here? Less Rotarians than polar bears? That's amazing. Okay, I will explain the four-way test to you then. I walked into this group of predominantly older white male businessmen 
And as I was walking into the Rotarian Club meeting in West Texas, I noticed they had this big banner up in their blue and yellow colors called the four-way test. And it said, is it fair? Is it beneficial to all? Would it build goodwill? And now I can't remember the last of the four-way test. Um, something along the lines of, would it, would it be good for all? And I looked at this list and I thought to myself, is it real? Yes, climate change is real. Is it beneficial? Absolutely not. It disproportionately affects those who are already suffering today. Would it build goodwill to fix? I, oh, it would, for sure. Would it benefit all? That's number four. Yes, it would. So luckily they had a lunch first. So I took my slides and I quickly rearranged them. I changed my slides every single time because <laughs> there's never the same people. I rearranged them quickly and I stuck in four title slides. Is it real? Is it beneficial? <laughs> Would it build goodwill? And I walked them through the four-way test on climate change. And after I spoke, one of them had a banker who I'd met before, he came up to me and had this look on his face that I can only describe as just completely, he did not know what had hit him. He walked up and he said, you know, I wasn't really on board with this whole climate change thing, but it passed the four-way test. <laughs> In the spirit of, well, what can I say? It must be true. What had happened? Serendipitously, I had managed to connect with the value system that defined his life. And that was what made all the difference. It's not just about connecting with, with the, the values, though. It's also about giving hope. And although that may seem hard... The second most frequent question I get these days, besides what keeps you up at night, is what gives you hope. Although it seems hard to find hope in this world, and believe me, if you think it's hard to find hope, imagine if you lived in Texas right now. Imagine if you had just published a giant climate science report for the federal government that you poured your blood, sweat, and tears into for two years unpaid, and the response of the White House was to take your chapter that you had written, take one of its key messages, and completely twist and distort it to say that climate change doesn't matter. That is what happened. They took my key message, and they changed it from the future magnitude of climate change depends on emissions from human activities and the sensitivity of the climate system to those emissions, and they changed it to, well, the report says that future climate change just depends on the sensitivity of the earth, and we don't know what that is. So imagine that that was your life. How do you find hope? I can tell you, you absolutely can find hope if you look for it. Where do we find hope? We don't find hope in science. That's not what it's designed to give us. We can find hope two ways. One is looking to other people. Do you know how much good there is going on in this world if we look for it? The news media is not usually motivated to share that hope, except in like the third or fifth or 18th page. The murders, the tragedies, the ridiculous statements by world leaders, they capture the headlines. But if we dig a little bit deeper, we can see the hope. The hope that solar panels, pay-as-you-go solar, is giving sub-Saharan Africa, where 600 million people have no access to electricity of any kind. The hope spawned by the fact that solar energy is breaking records for the lowest prices ever in places like India. The fact that in Texas, last year, we got 12% of our energy from wind. The first quarter of this year, we got 23% of our energy from wind in Texas. The fact that even though the United States is saying it's pulling out of the Paris Agreement, so far, enough cities, states, and corporations have committed to meeting the Paris Agreement that they make up, to date, 30% of the U.S. economy, or sorry, 40% of the U.S. economy and 30% of its population. We can look for hope and we can find it when we look for it and what people are doing, and that's what we need to have the conversations about. Because what's going to motivate us to act is realizing that we're not alone. Everybody else is acting too. The boulder is already starting to roll downhill. It just needs a few more hands on the boulder. It isn't stationary. It's moving. And the second thing, personally, and this is very personal, what gives me hope is my faith. That is the purpose of my faith. The idea that there is more. That there is the possibility for change. And... As I shared with my seatmate during dinner, 
When I first started looking into what my faith had to do with my science, I went online and I ordered all the books people had ever written about it because, of course, I'm an academic and that's what academics do. I think I read about 80 books on the topic. I ordered the Green Bible that had all the verses highlighted in green and I looked through them. <laughs> but the more I've thought about this issue, the more I've worked on this issue, the more I've talked on this issue, I've realized that my favorite verse in the Bible has nothing to do with creation. It isn't even to do with helping the widows or the poor. My favorite verse in the Bible is this. And I think no matter who we are and what we believe, we can take this verse to heart. God is not the author of fear. Timothy, 2 Timothy. God is not the author of fear. What does fear do? Fear gives us a knee-jerk reaction and then paralyzes us. When you are afraid, what do you do? You run and you hide. God is not the author of fear. And then it goes on to say, what is it that we do have from God? We have love. We have power, which means to get stuff done. And my favorite, we have a sound mind. So when I see people expressing fear, and you see fear on all ends of the spectrum, My hope comes from the fact that I know that that fear is not coming from God. But what I do have, and what I think we all have, is we all have that ability to love and empathize with and have compassion for our fellow human beings. We all have the freedom and the ability to choose to act in however a small a way that we can. And we have been given the gift of a sound mind. And as a scientist, I have to say I love that one the most. A sound mind to make good decisions that help us, help our family, help our community, help our region, and help our country. Thank you. So when, when, we, were, um, when we were sitting in the vestry, I said, okay, this is what we're going to be doing then, Catherine, so we're going to ask you to maybe speak for a few minutes, maybe like 20 minutes, and her face just fell, and she went, oh, oh, nobody mentioned me that I was going to have to speak. I thought it was a Q&A. Clearly, <laughs> clearly the spirit moves. There you go, yes. But that, those were all my points. I'm done. There's no second point. <laughs> okay, well, I'll do the rest of the talking. <laughs> um, let's start with an interesting question. Um, so... We, we, know, we, know that this is, we know that this is tricky. We know that there's this disconnection. We know that, we know that something, something to add to what you say, but we know that when you ask people, are you concerned about climate change, they'll say yes. But then when you ask people, tell me the things you're really concerned about, somehow climate change has fallen yeah. off. And I'm, I'm interested in what we've been... Scientists have been pushing this and campaigners have been pushing this and everybody's been trying to talk about this for, what, 20, 30 years now? I mean, this is our generation. So what's gone wrong? What have we done wrong that we haven't, that we failed to get people to make that shift from something that they're concerned about to something they remember they're concerned about? Yes. What, what, What is it? If you asked me, where, where, do you, where do you think climate change should be on our priority list? My answer to that would actually be, I don't think it should be on our priority list. Okay. The reason why I care about a changing climate is because it affects all of the other things that are already on my priority list. It affects the safety of my family and my community. It affects the future of my child. It affects people who, as I said, are are poor, are vulnerable, are suffering in the places where we live, as well as in countries on the other side of the world. It exacerbates issues like hunger, poverty, lack of access to clean water, disease, even refugee crises. If we care about any of these issues, even if we care about the economy and national security, if we care about almost anything that most of us do, that's why you care about climate change. 
It isn't a case of saying, oh, it's number 18 on my list. It really should be number three. I'll work hard on making it number three. I'll think about it more. I'll concentrate. I'll focus. Maybe I can get it up to number five next year, maybe number four. Then it... No. The only reason that we really should care about climate change is because it affects everything else we already care about. So what I think we have failed to do to answer your question is we have failed to connect the dots. Mm. We have presented it as a separate issue over here that we really should care about, but in reality, in our day-to-day lives, we have these other things that we care about. And I guess, and I guess that reflects on whether it's defined as being an environmental issue. Would oh, yes. I'd like to expand on that, because you already touched on uh-huh. polar bears, which is a pet peeve of us in, in yes. climate outrage. <laughs> so, so. I was very happy to see that, yes. <laughs> so, uh-huh. so tell us, is there an issue there with it being defined in a particular yes. box, in a particular way? It is. I'd, climate change should not be called an environmental issue. Because that implies that somehow we humans can survive just fine without our planet. We can float around in the depths of space if we lose our environmental issues because we'll still have a healthy economy. Not. (laughs) But that's the implication. Climate change is not an environmental issue. It is a human issue. It is a humanitarian issue. It matters because it affects almost every aspect of our lives. The food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the safety of our homes, the health of our economy, and the political stability of our world. What else is there that makes our lives meaningful? And I should add, I'm sorry, our health. It affects that too. That's what makes our lives worth living, is all of those things. Now, as a, as a proud environmentalist, I've always felt that environmentalism was the way to lead on this. Mm. And when we started doing the communications work, I increasingly spent time in conversations, as you've described, with people of conservative values. And the thing which started really causing me concern was that they appeared to be defining their position on climate change as not being environmentalists. In other words, that's what those liberal environmentalists, and let's bring Al Gore into this conversation as well, that's what they say, and I am not them, therefore I don't accept what they're saying. Is that what's happening, and is there something that again, has gone wrong. How do we rebalance this? Well, I have even had people say to me, (coughs) after attending a presentation or having a conversation in depth about why we think this thing is real and why it matters, I have literally had multiple people say to me, what you said makes complete sense, and I would love to agree with you, but I cannot ever agree with you because that means I would be agreeing with Al Gore. Yeah. It has been... been politicized, and the environmental part is just part of the politicization. Unfortunately, environmental, which some would argue should be the ultimate conservative value, right? Conserving your resources. Isn't that conservative? Yes. Some would argue that environmental should be conservative, but over the last few decades, it has become increasingly politicized in many countries, to the point where it seems to be the property of one part of the political spectrum. And to the extent to which we derive our personal identity from our politics, the more strongly we do that, the more likely we are to reject issues that we think are associated with parts of the political spectrum that we do not identify with. So the question I guess I have is, 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 that, is that because the environmental movement or the people in America, you would say liberals, the people on the left of a political spectrum have taken too strong an ownership such that it pushes away conservatives? Because they would say, why are we getting the blame? We've just been trying to fight for it. Or yeah. is it that conservatives have not moved into that space and sufficiently claimed it for themselves? As I said, it's, it's a human issue. And so everyone who's human has all the values they already need to care about it. And if they are a human who does not care about it, the only reason is because we haven't been able to connect the dots. So in that sense, I would actually say environmentalists are humans, and they connected the dots. And So why should they not care about it? But those dots have not been connected for people on other parts of the political spectrum. And I would go even further, and I would say that there has, have been deliberate investments to obscure or muddy or disconnect the dots to the point where people now believe if I am a fill-in-the-blank, that means I could never agree on climate action because that would be against who I am. As I said in the introduction, I mean, uh, what, what particularly inspires me of what you do is that I, I know you're wary of this term, climate evangelist, but I mean that you are, 
<laughs> yeah, I know. You're, you're, yes. you're wincing, as I said. It because as means you good say, news. Yeah, it's, yes. the, it's meant to be the good news, yeah. It's but, not good news. <laughs> but, but, but this idea of going and speaking to challenging audiences, and I'd like you to speak a little bit about personally what happens when you do that, because I know in America it is so bitterly bitterly polarized at the moment. I mean, do you get personal, do you get personal abuse to people? Do people threaten you? What happens with you, Catherine, when you go into that space? Um, every day. Right. Every day. In the United States, if any climate scientist sticks their head out of the ivory tower, and by sticking their head out, I mean give a lecture at their child's school, write an op-ed in the local newspaper, be interviewed on the radio, have the university issue a press release about some research they did, participate in a federal report, or heavens forbid, be interviewed on Fox News. That was what did me in. After that, the chancellor tried to get rid of me. There were too many outraged alumni. The fact that I would pollute their news channel with my radical views. So as soon as any scientist or any you know, proponent of climate change sticks their head out in the public sphere, it will get shot at. And that, unfortunately, is the world we live in. And in that sense, this issue is a casualty of much larger societal issues. And by larger, I don't mean in terms of that they affect us in a greater way, but much more broad social issues that we are dealing with with many different things. The breakdown of civil discourse in society the fact that the anonymity that the internet provides for people to purvey the most foul abuse that they would never say in person. And I've actually had the experience of meeting face-to-face -face somebody who is one of my most dedicated abusers, um, you know, writes blogs frequently online and cites hundreds of people to attack me. I actually met him in person one time. Interesting. He was as meek and yeah, as kind yes. and gentle as a little ba lamb. He sat in the front row, he smiled and nodded, he asked polite questions, he thanked us so much, and then he wrote, went home and wrote an excoriating and completely untruthful blog under his pseudonym about what he had seen. So it, we don't just see this in climate science, we see this everywhere. So the question is, well, so how do, you get, how do I get to talk to people? <laughs> and the question is, the, the answer is through, through building relationships. So the first time I was ever invited to speak anywhere, it was to a group that another woman in my department was part of. The next time I was invited to speak was to a group that a woman who had been in the first audience was part of. I get invitations that, where they phone, you, they, they phone you up and they start kind of like this. Well, I'm calling from such and such Baptist University in Central Texas, and We've never had a climate scientist come to speak to us before. We were wondering if you might be interested in doing a chapel service. You're probably not. And you can tell from the tone of voice, we kind of hope you aren't. <laughs> but so-and-so at this other Baptist college said that you were OK. <laughs> and we could have you in. And those are the invitations where I say, yes, I'm coming. <laughs> so. You might think that those are the toughest situations, but they're not. The toughest situations are the business communities and the planning community, people who actually need this information to plan. So I keep thinking, I've kind of you know, hit, hit the, the top of the hill and I can start coasting downhill, and every time I think that, a new challenge comes along. And my two, the two biggest challenges I've actually had to date came along just in the last two months. <laughs> And one of them was to speak to the Texas Association of Water Conservation, or Texas Water Conservation Association, which is water managers across the state. And then the second one was to speak to the entire leadership team of one of the biggest oil and gas companies in Texas. So with the water managers, the first speaker in the session was a state senator who says climate change isn't real. The second was the head of a state agency who says that they don't include climate change in their planning, and then there was me. Yeah. And I was introduced as a climate scientist, so I couldn't exactly hide what I was. You know, sometimes when you're just meeting somebody, you know, a neighbor down the street or, you know, a new person at church, and they ask you what you do, I admit, sometimes I just say, I work at the university. And they say, what do you do? I say, oh, I'm a professor. 
<laughs> because sometimes you don't want to have that conversation. But when they introduce you as a climate scientist, everybody knows who you are. So I've been around the block. I was invited to that group because there were water managers who had heard me and who I had developed a relationship with, and we trusted each other. I could see one guy, I could see Tom over here smiling and nodding at me. I could see Ken at the back waving. I knew I had two friendly faces in the sea of 350 people. So I went for it. Out of the half hour, the first 10 minutes, I talked about drought and flood and precipitation variability and El Nino and natural cycles and natural variability and everything that they knew all about. And so all the heads start to nod, like, oh, she gets it. She understands there's natural cycles. Then I talked about observed trends. What has already happened? Our droughts are getting worse. Our heavy rainfall is getting worse. Have you seen this? What did you see in the place where you live? Here's what it looks like in Houston. Here's what it looks like in Dallas. Here's what it looks like where I live in Lubbock. And then the last third, I talked about the future. I talked about what happens if we continue on our current pathway. What happens if things end up better than we thought? How can we build resilience into our systems? And at the end of the presentation, everybody clapped. Nobody booed. There was no rotten tomatoes or leftover lunch thrown. And a couple of people came up to talk to me, and this woman was first in line, and she ran up to me and grabbed my hand and shook it enthusiastically, and she said, thank you for that presentation. That made so much sense. I agree with everything you said. Those people who go around talking about global warming all the time, I don't agree with them at all, but this, this makes total sense. <laughs> and they invited me back. <laughs> this brings nicely onto something I wanted to ask about testing communications. You know, we... Hmm. We, we like to say that there's, um, we like to say there's a science to climate change and there's a science to communications oh, too, right? Oh, there is. Yes, there we is. We can go and test it. We can run experiments. We can, we can do qualitative, quantitative testing. We do a lot of social research in climate outreach. And it's very interesting to me that I saw that recently in, um, uh, a, a paper came out um, uh, which tested your communications. It was a, a paper by Brian Webb and Doug Hayhoe. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting name, I thought. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but, Brian but, but he's also it, yes. a specialist in education as well, isn't yes. he? Yeah. But what was interesting about this, I thought, was that they tested your presentation alongside other climate change presentations, and they tried to see what the shift was before and after in attitudes, and they found a, nearly a, a 50%, and you were doing this in a, a New York evangelical college, right? Mm -hmm. And Tell us, not the city of New York. No. Upstate, Upstate New York. Right. Rural New York. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm very interested if you could unpack that a little for us. In this testing, what were the key things that you were saying that helped you to shift more than these other presentations? And mm -hmm. uh, to, sh to have 50% of your audience shifting their views, that's a significant shift, right? So pin it down. What, were, what, did, you, what did you get right? So this was an interesting experiment where I'm often invited to yeah. speak many places, more places than I can go. And so when I was invited to speak at Houghton College, which is a small Wesleyan college in upstate New York, initially my response was, well, it's out in the middle of nowhere. I don't have anything else planned for that location. I'm afraid I can't come. And then the person who invited me, a man called Brian Webb, said, well, I'm really hoping you could come because I'm planning to run my graduate research on you. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and he said, well, I'm very interested in effective messaging, in doing mm -hmm. the science of communication, and I would like to test people before and after they attend your lecture. And I would also like you to prepare a couple of different versions of the lecture, and we can give those to students in a room watching a video, as well as having students attend your talk in person, to see if video makes a difference or, or versus mm -hmm. live, and to see if what part of the content makes a difference. So immediately I said, well, I have to do this because anecdotally, I certainly have had people come up and say positive things like the woman, but I've had other people even say things like, you know, you dragged my sorry denier's ass to the truth. One of my favorite compliments ever. I'll put that one on a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm going I'm to frame it and put it on my office wall. <laughs> yes. But the number of people who tell me that is not a large number because it takes significant yeah. courage as well as investment of time to seek out somebody and especially because your opinion might change over a longer period of time it might not be an instantaneous thing so I didn't really know is all the investment I put into speaking to people actually making a difference because if it isn't making a difference I don't want to be doing it I want to be doing what makes the biggest difference so I jumped on the chance I went there we made all these videos ahead of time we did the the, the talk we tested them before and the and after and then I sat here like this, waiting for the results. 
And I still remember I met up with Brian in Paris because Brian actually runs a group of evangelicals that are all about personal climate action and creating online communities where people can engage and act together as a community. So I met up with Brian in Paris. He pulled out his laptop. He opened the Excel file. He said, I have some preliminary results. I still remember sitting there going, oh, no. <laughs> What's it going to be? And he said, I think we got significance. And I said, on how many questions? Because he asked them about 12 different questions on various aspects of not just the science, but in terms of how important this is, how likely you are to support action on this. And he said, I think we have significance on all but one question. I was like, oh. <laughs> and then he said, but I think I need some help analyzing the statistics. Do you want to do it with me? And I said, well, I don't think that's appropriate. <laughs> I think it would be really hard to be very unbiased on the statistics. But So do we know what it was in your presentation? Oh, yes. Was the key Wait, so what thing? was it? Yes, thank yeah, you. So, so it was not whether you address the misconceptions about science or not. It was not debunking the myths. It was not talking about how we really know temperatures going up or those scientists did not fake the data. What changed the minds was what was common to most of the presentations, which was the simple and brief framing, five minutes at the beginning, five minutes at the end, that wrapped the entire thing within the reference frame of Christian belief. Right. Right. That was what made the difference. Because, yeah. as I talked about before, I was bonding and connecting, and there's almost a physical opening of the ears when that bonding and connecting has happened, as opposed to when you think you are listening to somebody who you have nothing in common with, mm. you think would never understand you, and you think you would never agree with. So could we take that to other audiences? I mean, we, we think so, because this is the advice mm. we give. But in your yes. experience, like, so, for example, if you're speaking to coal miners, well, we could take your, your president, for example. He goes out there and says, I dig coal, I love you coal miners. You can just see them going, oh... Someone says they love yeah. us. Yeah. So, I mean, can we, but, I mean, can we do that? Can we start by validating and, and mm -hmm. saying what you are is important and then we lead into the... You can. So, and does it work? If it's sincere, of course, it, it has to be sincere. It has to be sincere. And yeah. if you can't do it sincerely, don't do it. Mm. There's somebody else who can have that conversation. Yeah. So, if I'm speaking to water managers, I talk about water. If I'm speaking to cities, I talk about the issues that cities struggle with. Um, if I'm talking to, you know, fellow parents, bond over our kids. My second most difficult presentation in the last couple months was to an oil and gas company. How do you bond with an oil and gas company? I thought about this long and hard. With love. With love, yes, with love. <laughs> but you have to have a point of genuine connection and appreciation. So here's what I did. I started with talking about all of the benefits that the Industrial Revolution brought us. The fact that we live longer lives, we live better lives, we live healthier lives, we have a higher standard of living, we have light bulbs, refrigerators, cars, airplanes, medical technology. I mean, I, I believe that if I was born, you know, in the early 1800s versus the late 1900s, I would probably be dead. When I was one and a half years old, I was toddling along in one of those walkers with wheels in the backyard, and I tripped and fell into the window well, down four feet, landed on my head and fractured my skull. I still have an enormous bump on my skull this big, so I hope I never lose my hair. Um, you know, I think I would be dead. <laughs> Not right? all of us are so lucky. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Your head is perfectly symmetrical, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Thank there you. you go. I'll frame the denier's ass comment. You frame that one. <laughs> so, so I told them how I felt like I owed my life to the advances that we had made during the Industrial Revolution thanks to fossil fuels. And that was genuine. It really was. It took me a while to get to that point, but it was genuine. And then I said, but we didn't know. And I talked about what we didn't know back then. And I talked about what we know now. So it's not as if the oil and gas company was set up with the intention to completely screw the planet. They weren't. They were set up to give jobs to people, to make money, to support the local economy. They were a very family, you know, type of business. It wasn't Exxon. It was one of the kind of the second level ones that are, um, they're a state company, but they're pretty big. I mean, you should have seen the size of the building they were in. Um, and 
It worked. We, I was only supposed to be there about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. I was there for over two hours. And they were asking me genuine questions. We got into the Paris Agreement. We talked about the future of fossil fuels. They asked me, what should we be doing? We're an oil and gas company. Tell us what we should be doing. I said, well, that's a conversation we have to have together. I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you that the world is changing and you have to look down that road and see that the, ro the world is changing and understand that there is going to be a very different role for you in the future than you've had in the past. And I'm happy to walk with you and talk with you in that conversation, but I'm a climate scientist. I'm not, you know, I can't give you the answer to that, but the conversation was amazing. And I really think it was at least in part because we were able to genuinely connect and I was able to, believe it or not, express a genuine appreciation for the role that fossil fuels had played in our lives and even in my life personally. Now I have a last question, so. but also mm -hmm. I've got a sense on the time because we really want to open it up to you as well. But I have to ask this, um, because it's the thing which is also fascinating about your work, is the connection between your, your deep faith and your science. And of course, the interesting question, which I'm sure is on <laughs> many people's minds, I'm sure you get asked often, uh -huh. is about the division between, between mm -hmm. science and faith. I wanted to mention a really fascinating thing here that probably very few people know about, which is Sir John Horton, the, mm -hmm. the founder of the Met Office in Britain, and also the first, uh, the inaugural chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, mm -hmm. is also a preacher, in a, a lay preacher in a Methodist church. And he used to be Plymouth Brethren. Did he now? Yeah. That I didn't know. Yes. And he, did a, he did a wonderful thing where mm -hmm. he brought together some of the leading evangelicals, including from the United States, deeply skeptical people here to Oxford, mm -hmm. and they had a week of science and prayer. And I know this very well because I was trying to get in there and they said, there is no way you can come in because you are not in the group. So in other words, they kept it. Yeah. Because all the environmentalists wanted to be in there, of right? Of course. And I'm interested if you could explore for us in the kind of final point in this stage about how you put these two things, how you put these two things together, how your faith informs, informs your science and mm -hmm. these two things which are so often kept separate, what the relationship is between them. Yes. Thank you. There is a long tradition in the UK of many notable and famous scientists from Newton to Faraday and many others on to Houghton, specifically connecting their faith with their science. Now, in recent decades, in the last century, it's become much more popular to have the idea that you have to pick one. You have to choose a side, either faith or science, and you can't possibly do both. But the reality is, whether you go to the Bible or whether you go to Google for your definitions, in the Bible it says that faith is the evidence of things not seen. And if I were back then, when they were writing the book of Hebrews, I would have joggled their elbow and said, well, you forgot the second part of the verse. The second part clearly is science is the evidence of things seen. And if you go to Google and you actually Google the definitions for faith and science, and if you don't believe me, you can do this, it specifically says faith is based on spiritual apprehension rather than physical proof, whereas science is based on observable, testable theories. So there are two very different things meant to serve very different purposes. Uh, one one metaphor that people often use when talking about science is that science is like a compass. It can tell you which way is north and south, east and west, but it can't tell you the right way to go because the right way to go is not a, necessarily a science decision. And we were talking about this earlier today. What's the right temperature target? One and a half or two degrees? What are the right choices and actions and policies to put in place? Science can inform those decisions, but it cannot give you a definitive answer because it depends on our values. It depends on our beliefs, it depends on the deepest part of ourselves and what we think is most important. And so one of my favorite colleagues is a woman called Elaine Eklund. She is a social scientist at Rice University in the U.S. And when she was attending church a number of years ago, a Presbyterian church, um, you know, during the meet and greet when you shake people's hands, the woman in front of her turned around and they were chatting and they were talking about some science thing. And the woman said to Elaine casually, you know all those scientists are atheists. And Elaine, being a sociologist, said, well, I wonder about that. I'm going to investigate that. So she did investigate it, and she found that of all of the 
hundreds of scientists at top research universities in the U.S. that she surveyed, and those scientists come from all over the world, most of them probably are not even U.S., of all of those scientists, 70% described them as having an important spiritual component to their lives. In other words, that there was more to it than just the science. And then 35% would say that they explicitly believed in a god. So I think that science is important, science is valuable. When it comes to climate change, science can tell us that climate is changing, humans are responsible, the risks are real, and the risks are disproportionate to the responsibility. In other words, those who have produced the most carbon are actually bearing the least of the impacts and vice versa. Science can tell us that. Science can tell us what the impacts look like under a one and a half degree or a two or a three degree target, but science cannot tell us what's the right thing to do. That's where we need what's in our hearts, and for about 85% of us around the world, what is written in our hearts has much more to do with our faith. And for 100% of us, what's written on our hearts has everything to do with being human, being this rare, bizarre species that will act altruistically even to our own detriment. That is who humans are. And that has nothing to do with the science. It has nothing to do with cold, hard facts. It has everything to do with empathy and compassion and concern for our brothers and our sisters. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful answer. I'd like to hand over... Jamie, our executive director, Jamie Clark, will lead us into the next part where we open up the conversation, Jamie. Can you hear me? Even up at the back? Very good. Not. Um, I work on this five days a week, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, cl uh, communicating climate change, and it's a real honour to be heading up climate outreach, but it's even more of an honour uh, to have Catherine here with us, someone who has... Uh, really channeled um, so much of her life's work into challenging not only cultural uh, stereotypes within the scientific world, but actually going out and challenging in the most difficult environments. She's a person who all of us can see um, holds the, the challenge of climate change really boldly in her, but she has had a really hard situations to deal with and, and for me and I think a lot of you here you'll probably recognize what a hero she is for what she does and a real inspiration so I just wanted to say that um, and uh, now is our chance to take a little bit of that um, challenge and to ch channel it uh, through conversations. Um, Climate Outreach is an organization that tries to channel conversations in different ways around this issue through different communities um, of faith and values and wider understanding. Um, and I'd like to channel the, the traditional uh, faith um, focus on having those conversations, on bringing people together. So for the next five minutes, I thought, have a look around you. Find someone that you don't know, that you haven't already talked to, and try and discuss what Catherine and George have been dis discussing now. Think about what they've said, think about the challenges they've laid down, and maybe come up with some questions that you'd like to ask. So five minutes, talk to the person that you don't know beside you or near you, um, and we'll discuss your conversation. Thanks. Um, right, we're going to take some questions and answer in a traditional format. I'm going to ask... Um, the roaming mic people one's Lydia and then there's one upstairs uh, Gavin to go and we'll take batches at three um, we like questions prefer questions to Catherine but if someone has got a point to make we can understand that that is a valid part of the conversation but please keep them succinct and to the point point. <coughs> and if I raise my arm that's a signal that it's time to stop okay <laughs> and everyone will look at you if you don't in a bad way Right, um, so we'll start with one question at the, from this side, one at the top, and then we'll come down over to this side for another question. So the gentleman with his hand up at the front, and then I'm going to get some gender balance. So. Oh, not on yet. Not on. It says it's on. If, yes, that... If you were invited to give a half-hour talk to a group of U.S. 
pension fund fiduciaries on this topic who would typically be rather skeptical, how would you frame your first sort of Pauline 10 minutes? Okay. Okay, we'll take that and hold it. And there was another female hand up at the back. There, yeah, just behind the post. Please, Gavin. Hi, I'm interested in um, sort of the doom and gloom of a lot of climate change messaging, such as, you know, in the paper that'll say, oh, you know, your city will be underwater by four feet by this time. And I want to know what you think about that and sort of what's the responsibility of scientists and modelers who are producing this knowledge um, to make sure that it gets communicated in a way with hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, And then this gentleman in the middle with the glasses. Just keep going and you'll... He'll grab you. There we are. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was great. Uh, I was just wondering if you've ever reached out to congressmen in, in the States and if you can affect their view, because it seems as if their opinion is a lot more important than, than some locals, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Got those, Catherine? Okay. This is a memory test. <laughs> So what would I say to pension fund managers? Well, recently I was invited to speak to a national conference of housing investors, which is not that different. They aren't people who own real estate companies. They're people who own 10,000 rental homes across the country. They aren't insurance companies. They're reinsurance companies. So it was the same type of people who look at large amounts of investments. Now, their investments were primarily in housing and real estate, And they wanted to know where should they be pulling their money out of and where should they be putting it into. They were very concerned about safety. Our session originally at this whole big conference originally only had a couple of, you know, dozen people signed up. And after Hurricane Harvey hit, hit, I think everybody in the conference was in our session. Uh, So I, in that sense, it was a bit easier because I knew what their concern was. It was, it was evident and we could talk about their concerns. So with the pension fund managers, I would, do, I would try to do a bit of digging. I would ask some information for the person who invited me. What, what type of investments are you invested in? I mean, you know, I still remember my parents', my par- my parents teacher's pension fund um, owned Maple Leaf Gardens where the hockey team played. <laughs> that was one of their investments. Not every pension fund does that. I would want to know where their investments are, and then I would look at which one of those are at risk, and I would speak specifically to the areas that they care about that are at risk. So often it does require a bit, of, a bit of digging in the background. And then the question about the doom and gloom messages, that's just something I struggle with all the time because, as I said before, when we look at the science, there is precious little hope in the science. Once in a while, we get some good news. Once in a while, it turns out that something isn't as bad as we thought or there's a positive impact. Yeah, there are positive impacts of warming. There's a positive impact that we discover that's good. But the vast majority of times, we're finding out, and there's actually research showing this, we are finding out that we have systematically underestimated the rate and the magnitude of change in many of these systems. We know that there are things that are going to happen in the future that we don't even know about, but we do know that there are, are great, there's a greater chance they'll be worse rather than better than we think. When I look at the science, there is precious little hope. Yet if we as humans do not have hope, we will not be able to act. It's almost a self-defeating cycle. If we don't have the hope, we will by definition fail. But if we have the hope, we actually have the chance of success. Where does that hope come from? It doesn't come from the science. And so if we as a scientist do not feel comfortable speaking beyond a strict adherence to the science, I don't think we're the right person to be talking to people about why this matters and how we can fix it. And that's okay, because we need people who do amazing research, who are in the lab or on the computer all day and all night publishing their papers, doing their research. We need those people. We need people who are really good at synthesis, who are writing the IPCC reports, who are are pulling together this information and giving us the big picture. And we also need people who are engaging and talking about this, people who are willing to say, I'm not just a brain in a jar. I am a full human with concerns, fears, hopes, and loves, and I'm willing to share with you both from my head and my heart why this matters. The fear and the concern and the anxiety, that's all in the head, but the hope and the love, that's in the heart. And then the last question was, uh uh-oh. About the Republican. Hmm? 
Republican situation? Oh, what would I say to it? Like a senator or a congressman? Okay, so I've, I've had a couple of these conversations. <laughs> and I don't, I don't have conversations unsolicited. I often get asked, could you please talk to my congressman? In kind of that tone of voice. And my answer is, well, I'm happy to talk with her or him if they want me to. But I'm not just going to go in there unsolicited because their ears will be closed. Despite that, I have had a number of conversations um, with, um, with elected representatives in the U.S. And with the Republicans, they're ones that they actually asked for. And I've had some very candid conversations with people who are searching for a way that is politically acceptable for them to come out of the closet. And I am not downplaying the significance of that term. Because if you know a man called Bob Inglis, very conservative Republican, very conservative, one day his son came to him when he was running for re-election. Everybody was happy with him. He'd done a great job. He was very popular. He's running for re-election. His son came to him and his son said, Dad, I love you and I support you, but I cannot vote for you if you're not going to take climate change seriously. And give that man total respect. He respected his son. He said, all right, son, show me what you got. Hit me with it, because I haven't heard anything that makes me think this is real, so give it to me. He did. He changed his mind. He announced to the world that he cared about climate change because he was conservative and because he was a Christian. And you know what happened? He lost in the primaries. He didn't even lose to a candidate from the other party. He lost to an upstart who came up and challenged him for that one reason. So the conversations I often have are, how can I come out about this issue? And I'm, one of the things that gives me hope, you know how I talked earlier about how people give me hope? One of the things that give me hope is the fact that in the United States, there is something called the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus. It was founded by Citizens Climate Lobby, which is an amazing uh, bipartisan organization. They'll take anybody from any part of the political spectrum and they'll engage with anybody. And the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus was founded by two representatives from Florida, one Republican and one Democrat. And you're only allowed to join the caucus if you have somebody, a partner, from the other side of the aisle. Yes. They're a year and a half old and they have 60 members. So 30 Republicans have come out and said, yeah, I think it's real and we want solutions. Now you might say 60 doesn't sound like that much. There's over 400 representatives. Yes, but you don't need all 400. You only need the critical mass of Republicans. And they're working on it. Great. Okay, last set of questions. So hands up. Um, Lots of hands. Uh, oh, well, while you're, while you're going yes. to them, sorry, yeah, point to the questions and let me yeah. say something. So that gentleman there and then someone at the top, Gavin, the lady with the glasses. I can't see you, but you... Yeah. So on Facebook, I don't know if you're on Facebook, but on Facebook every two weeks I do a live Q&A. And every other week, we release a new episode in our little series of videos called Global Weirding with uh, PBS, Public Broadcasting Systems. We do um, these short five to seven minute videos on frequently asked questions about climate change. Questions like, you know, what does the Bible say about climate change? Or questions like, hey, the oceans don't matter, do they? Or coming up, we have, aren't all those scientists in it for the money? And then the next one after that is, what about geoengineering? So we release a new video every other week, and then the week in between I do live Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can save them up, like my Facebook page. You'll get a notification when we're doing the live Q&A. You can watch the video. We have people tuning in from all over the world. We have people from Scotland and England all the time. We have people from Africa. We have people from all over North America. I don't know what time it is that people are joining <laughs> all at the same time, but it's super fun. So I know I can't get to all your questions, but that's an opportunity to get the questions in later. They can't sleep. They're so yeah, anxious. all the insomniacs, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Okay, so last two questions in real life. Um, so are there any methods or, or, yeah, I guess methods that we can help digesting when we're sharing really scary information online and not necessarily within a community or in the room? That's Great. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, you unpacked a little bit about how your um, faith has impacted your research. I wondered if I could ask the reciprocal question, which is how has your research into climate change impacted your faith? 
Okay, let's go with that. Okay. All right. So we live in a strange era where sometimes some of the people that we feel are our friends are people that we've never even met or we only see rarely once or twice a year because we connect with them online. And online is often where we end up sharing information and even having dialogues on this information. The most popular news article about climate change in this entire past year was an article published this summer in the New Yorker magazine that was headed by the picture of a grinning skull. And it was a complete doom and gloom. The world is ending. It's being destroyed. It's like when the asteroid hit the dinosaurs. It's all over. That was the number one message? Yeah, (laughs) right? How do we talk about these types of things? It's challenging because we're drawn to bad news. That's why all of the news headlines are always bad news. It's like we're attracted to it like moths to a bright light. Yet it leaves us feeling terrible. It leaves us feeling all those negative emotions we talked about. How do we engage online? I think online is actually one of the places where I go to look for positive stories and where I specifically share positive stories. It's the number one place where I, I look for and I make sure I follow a couple of pages that post positive information. And if you look, for example, at my Facebook page and my Twitter feed, you will see that a fairly large proportion of what's there is positive information because that's what we need. So rather than being a challenge, I think social media can actually be a useful tool to help spread hope. Because when I post these hopeful stories, I feel, by the time I post a hopeful story, like the fact that in Iceland there's a power plant that is now carbon negative, it actually not only creates power, it takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turns into stone. I feel like everybody knows this, but when I post it online, almost every comment is, wow, I had no idea. We just don't share the good news as much as we should, and so I think it's an opportunity. All right. Um, A question that I often get, which is related to your final question too, is, We often have, we hear from people who say, you know, I believed in God until I went to university and took all these science courses, and then I realized that there was this conflict between my science and my faith, but I was raised differently. Uh, My dad is actually, was a science teacher, and then became an expert in science curriculum development, and so I was raised with the idea that, which I didn't realize how odd and unusual it was, in our culture today, but I believe it was quite common in, you know, in previous decades and centuries. I was raised with the idea that if science and faith are in conflict, then, or if they appear to be in conflict, it's because we don't fully understand enough about one or the other or possibly both. And with a little humility and a little time, we might be able to figure some of it out. Some of it we might not figure out. But if we truly believe that God created the universe then how could studying God's creation ever conflict with who God is? Maybe it's conflicting with our narrow views and our limited interpretations of who we think God is. But it could never fundamentally conflict if we believe it was created by the same person. If I'm going to be totally honest, the only thing that has led me not to question my faith in God, but to question my faith in the church are the Christians who have attacked me. I, when, when people attack me, and it happens every day on social media, sometimes multiple people per day, I'm curious who these people are. I don't spend a lot of time, but I just quickly click on their profiles before I ban them. And it absolutely shocked me when it dawned on me that fully half of the people who were attacking me, sometimes in the most vicious and unsolicited ways, Half of those people were people who, in their profiles, specifically identified as being Christian. They had Bible verses in their profiles. They had Jesus follower, Christ lover in their profiles. Some of them were even pastors or ministers of churches. And to one of those, I still remember, to one of those, he was a pastor of a church in Texas. I actually responded to him. I said, dear sir, I am a pastor's wife. Would you like it if somebody said that about your wife? And he said, oh, well, you deserve it. That's the only thing that has led me to question not my faith, not my belief in God, not my belief in the goodness of God, but my belief that God can somehow live in and act in people is people who profess to bear his name yet act in the most hateful and unchristian way possible. 
And I would say that's probably been really honestly my greatest struggle, but also I think my greatest learning experience because it just shows us how imperfect we all are. You know, all of us say things, do things, act in ways that are not consistent with what we believe and who we, who we really are. And so it's made me, made me realize that, you know, it's, import, it's even more important to act like who you are. And so when I talk to people who are Christians, who share my faith, who don't agree that climate change is important, I'm not trying to change people's values because I'm not going to judge them either. Maybe they aren't really true believers, but if they really are Christians, then we believe that we are people who have been given God's love in our hearts to share with others. And so I'm not trying to change people's values. What I'm trying to do is, as it says in the book of James, hold up a mirror. The book of James says you're like a man who looked in a mirror and then went away and forgot who you are. So this experience has simply challenged me to act like who I am rather than who the tribal and cultural and social pressures of our world and our interactions with other people, which sometimes can be very unpleasant, um, to act like who I really am rather than what these external forces are trying to push us to be. Thank you. Thank you. I think a round of applause for Catherine would be... So, uh, we have a challenge for you. Climate Outreach wants the conversations not to finish when you leave the door or when you have one of the drinks we're supplying for you. We want you to think about your circle of influence. You believe in climate change. You believe it's a really important issue. But where have you got circles of influence that you don't like talking about the issue? Think about those communities Think about how you can have a conversation along the lines of Catherine's and keep talking to us. Tune into Catherine's podcasts and uh, video vlogs. They're amazing. They're really encouraging. But before we go or, and before we have a drink, I just wanted to invite um, Charlotte to lead us in a mo- moment of contemplation. If you wish to, to pray, please do. Or if you wish to take the chance just to contemplate on what you've heard tonight, then please do as well. And then after that, you're free to go or join us for a quick jink. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie and George and Catherine and all of Climate Outreach and the team. Um, As I said, please join us for a drink, Jamie and our team at St. Mary's would love you to continue your conversations with some bubbly over in the Adam de Broome Chapel. But I think we have heard such an amazing testament um, that we can all be agents of change, whatever our faith, whatever our gender, whatever our age, whatever our occupation, um, we have to connect. And I think, Catherine, if you said anything important, really important tonight, is that connection with our heart, our hope, and our love for one another. And we know we're in a very privileged situation right now. We live in a place which isn't underwater. We have most of us food and shelter and security. And there are millions and thousands of people around the world who are not in that situation. So in a moment of silence, can we bring them to our thoughts and minds and pray for the safety and security and the future of our world? Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. And one final round of applause for Catherine. Thank you. I think we really need to crack this thing of like how it's just normal when I'm having coffee with a friend and I sit down and we're just chatting about like how's life. I can be like, you know what, like... I'm really, really worried, but we don't kind of think that we can have those conversations. You maybe just got to like personally shift that into the space of what is what is normal and what is acceptable to speak about for yourself. And if you do it, then maybe others might start as well. That story about yeah overcoming the kind of chasm of different cultures 
and how she did that really did sort of jolt me into thinking oh yeah you know what work could I have to do to reach this audience for example. Coming to it from a point of humility and of empathy and of sincerity it's good to have that reinforced and it's really lovely to have it heard from somebody who's done it so successfully.